the other night as we began this lectureship that one of the things that we are extremely proud of here at Bear Valley Bible Institute and Bear Valley Church of Christ is our association with the men at Apologetics Press. We have been training preachers for over 50 years to stand for the truth, and they've been in that fight uh, almost as long, I think, if not a little bit longer. Standing for truth and teaching truth in a world that rejects truth is not always easy. They have taken their shots, there's no doubt about it, and yet they continue on. The level of academic quality that, that these men bring to the table is exceptional. And we are so proud to have them in our classrooms each and every quarter to teach and to be a part of this work. Our speaker this hour is Jeff Miller, and I could take all of his time giving you his academic credentials. I'm not going to do that. You can read that in the uh, schedule of events or online. But uh, Jeff is, is eminently qualified to talk on apologetics. And he and his wife, Julie, live in Montgomery, Alabama. Again, he serves full time with Apologetics Press. And we're happy to have him in our classroom. We're happy to have him with us today. So let him come teach us about the Anthropic Principle. The Anthropic Principle. What in the world is that about? Well, I assure you, it's not as uh, scary as it might sound. All right, bear with me for a moment here. Technical difficulties. All right, there we go. All right, so the Goldilocks Principle. Uh, this is an idea that is uh, in the secular scientific community. Uh, the idea is that the earth appears to have been tailor-made for life to exist on it. Okay, and so the idea is it's like the bowl of porridge that was, that was just the right temperature and the bed was, was just the right softness for Goldilocks. Uh, the earth is just right for us. The anthropic principle takes that observation even further. Not only does just the earth appear to be perfectly designed for mankind, for us, uh, but our growing observations of the universe at large are pointing to the same idea on a universal scale, according to secular cosmologists. The universe appears to have been made for us to exist in it, uh, is the idea. Uh, Freeman Dyson is a theoretical physicist and Princeton University professor emeritus. He admitted, as we look into the universe and identify the many accidents of physics and astronomy that have worked together to our benefit, it almost seems as if the universe must in some sense have known that we were coming. Uh, the universe appears to be designed for us and without exception, when there is design, there's a designer. Uh, when you have a poem, you have a Poet, when you have a fingerprint, you have a finger. If you have a work of art, there is an artist who worked it, uh, so to speak. Well, so what kinds of things are secular cosmologists alluding to that imply that the universe seems to have been made for us? Okay, well, just focusing on the Earth for a moment, we find that the Earth's axis of rotation is perfect, uh, which allows for the perfect number and duration of the seasons that we have. Uh, its spin rate is perfect, uh, allowing humans to live on dry land closer to the equator. A faster spin rate would raise the water levels at the equator, forcing land-dwelling creatures to live closer to the poles, which would cause mad, uh, mass extinctions. Uh, its orbital distance from the sun is perfect. A small deviation would cause Earth to be incinerated by the sun, or frozen. Uh, liquid water is apparently a rarity. Its existence elsewhere is still debated, especially on the surface of other planets. Uh, the temperature on Earth, uh, which is a function of its perfect orbit around the sun, uh, as well as its atmospheric pressure, uh, they are again just right for liquid water to exist and abundance of it. Uh, so the importance of that fact is that water is recognized by secular scientists as being a key prerequisite uh, for life. Uh, and then there's the amount of water. 
the surface of the of the uh, the surface area of the Earth has about 75 percent water. Water has a special property that is unlike almost any other substance. It has what's called a high specific heat capacity, which means it can hold more heat or lose more heat than, than about any other substance without its temperature changing. And so that helps to keep the Earth's temperature from getting too drastic. Uh, when you look at what happens in the desert, for example, we find that the, that the days are extremely hot, the nights are extremely cold because of the lack of water. Uh, most of the earth doesn't have this condition because of the abundance of water that we have on, on the earth. So uh, less water or a different substance instead of water would prohibit life. Uh, when we zoom out now and look at the universe as a whole, we find that it too seems to have been designed for us. Uh, notice, for example, what leading secular cosmologists are saying. They're observing the universe and they're finding evidence that its perfection is nothing short of supernatural. In fact, it's so clear that according to Bernard Carr, who's a cosmologist at Queen's Mary University in London, he said, if you don't want God, you'd better have a multiverse. And the idea is the universe is so perfect for us that the only way to make sense of it without acknowledging that it was actually designed by a designer for us is to say that our universe is just one of an infinite number of universes. So there's an infinite number, and therefore it is inevitable that, it, that one of them would happen to be perfect for us, and we just happen to be in that one universe. That's the idea. So this statement by Carr is widely acknowledged now among the leading cosmologists. Uh, many of the articles that I've read on this subject in, in the major science magazines, they all point to this quote by Bernard Carr. And so such statements have caused many in the naturalistic community to begin latching on to the multiverse since they refuse to accept God as a universe designer. Uh, but latching onto the multiverse has its own problems, which I could spend an entire session discussing. Uh, it relies on string theory being true, uh, but string theory hasn't even been proven. It's, it's unobserved at this point. Uh, but that's not all. It also relies on inflation. Uh, that is a, a period of rapid inflation after the Big Bang, uh, where the universe expanded faster than the speed of light. There is zero evidence for inflation. And yet we add to that fact that there is there's also zero evidence for a multiverse. And in, according to cosmologists, there can never be any evidence for it because it's unobservable. And so notice, zero evidence translates to irrational. It requires a blind faith to believe in the multiverse. But hey, you know, if you don't want God, you better have a multiverse. And because the multiverse is unobservable, then the theory is also unscientific based on the naturalist's own definition of science. And further, even if there was a multiverse, one must then ask where the multiverse and its laws came from which is a point that even the leading cosmologists acknowledge. And so the multiverse merely moves the goalposts. It doesn't eliminate the need for a god. Uh, the multiverse also, by definition, admits the necessity of a supernatural realm. The natural realm is the universe with all of its matter and energy and laws. By definition, the multiverse theorizes the existence of other universes outside of our natural realm. In other words, a supernatural realm. And so a person who accepts the multiverse can no longer be a naturalist. He's a supernaturalist, just like you and me. Only he doesn't have any evidence for his position, unlike the Christian. And finally, even if the multiverse were true, it would actually prove the existence of God. Since in the multiverse, according to the cosmologist's own words, an infinite number of universes exist, and anything that is possible exists elsewhere in other universes. So... God must exist in at least one of these universes, and if He exists in one of them, then He must exist in all of them, since the biblical definition of God includes the fact that He is omnipresent. And so obviously the multiverse is not fixing the problem. Lee Smolin is a theoretical physicist, a faculty member at the Perimeter Institute for, for Theoretical Physicists and adjunct professor of physics at the University of Waterloo. He admitted we had to invent the multiverse. It's not based on actual evidence, it's based on imagination. It's unscientific. But if they don't want to concede the existence of God, then the evidence is forcing them to go somewhere. They need to accept something, 
no matter how far-fetched it may be. All right, why? You know, what kind of evidence is so forceful that cosmologists are acknowledging that something supernatural seems to be at play in order to explain the universe? Well, it's one thing for me to highlight things that I've observed, but I would argue it's more powerful to highlight things that they've observed that has caused them to admit that the universe couldn't have happened on its own. So I want to do that now for a few moments. Here are some examples of the quandaries that naturalists are facing from their own mouths. Uh, Well-known cosmologist George Ellis of the University of Cape Town in South Africa, he said, a remarkable fact about our universe is that physical constants have just the right values needed to allow for complex structures, including living things. I agree that the multiverse is a possible valid explanation for fine-tuning examples. Arguably, it is the only scientifically based option we have right now, but we have no hope of testing it observationally. All right, now, of course, non-observability and science are oxymorons based on the naturalistic definition of science. But notice, the physical constants that describe various characteristics of the universe have just the right values needed to allow for complex structures. It's just right for us. Notice what Ellis and professor of physics and astronomy at John Hopkins University, uh, Joseph Silk, admitted. The multiverse is motivated by a puzzle why fundamental constants of nature, such as the fine structure constant that characterizes the strength of the electromagnetic interactions between particles and the cosmological constant associated with the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, have values that lie in the small range that allows life to exist. Some physicists consider that the multiverse has no challenger as an explanation of many otherwise bizarre coincidences. The low value of the cosmological constant, known to be 120 factors of 10 smaller than the value predicted by quantum field theory, is difficult to explain, for instance. Uh, John Rennie, Rennie, who's the editor for Scientific American, he pondered the nature of time itself. The basic laws of physics work equally well forward or backward in time, yet we perceive time to move in one direction only, toward the future. Why? Now, why does time work that way? Well, that's a problem. Cosmologist and professor of physics at California Institute of Technology, Sean Carroll, he explained why. If the observable universe were all that existed, it would be nearly impossible to account for the error of time in a natural way. Okay, oops. Uh, apparently, there must be something beyond the observable universe. Uh, Smolin admitted, everything we know suggests that the universe is unusual. It's flatter, smoother, larger, and emptier than a typical universe predicted by the known laws of physics. If we reached into a hat filled with pieces of paper, each with the specifications of a possible universe written on it, it is exceedingly unlikely that we would get a universe anything like ours in one pick or even a billion. The challenge that cosmologists face is to make sense of this specialness. At first, inflation seemed to do the trick, but a closer look shows that we have just moved the problem further back in time. To make inflation happen at all requires us to fine-tune the initial conditions of the universe. All right, can't you hear their exasperation, pulling their hair out? They've examined the evidence, and it is shouting out to them, there's a God, there's a God. Stop denying it. You know, isn't it an amazing thing that the more we dig in and become more advanced in what we can study, even more evidence is coming out that, we, that no humans have probably ever known. In an article in Discover, Lee Folger quotes cosmologist and professor of physics at Stanford, Andre Lind. We have a lot of really, really strange coincidences, and all of these coincidences are such that they make life possible, Lynn says. Physicists don't like coincidences. They like even less the notion that life is somehow central to the universe. And yet recent discoveries are forcing them to confront that very idea. Call it a fluke, a mystery, a miracle, or call it the biggest problem in physics. Short of invoking a benevolent creator, many physicists see only one possible explanation. Our universe may be but one of perhaps infinitely many universes, in an inconceivably vast multiverse. Advocates argue that, like it or not, the multiverse may well be the only viable non-religious explanation for what is often called the fine-tuning problem, the baffling observation that the laws of the universe seem custom-tailored to favor the emergence of life. If there is no multiverse, where does that leave physicists? 
If there's only one universe, Carr says, you might have to have a fine tuner. If you don't want God, you'd better have a multiverse. So a lot of really, really strange coincidences that are a mystery, he said. Even miraculous. A problem for naturalists, he says. Fine-tuned, custom-tailored, uh, possibly the product of a benevolent creator, even. Uh, writing a new scientist, Stuart Clark and Richard Webb said, we can't explain the numbers that rule the universe. The different strengths of weak, strong, and electromagnetic forces, for example, or the masses of the particles it introduces. Were any of them to have even marginally different values, the universe would look very different. The Higgs boson mass, for example, is just about the smallest it can be without the universe's matter becoming unstable. Similar fine-tuning problems bedevil cosmology. Why is the carbon atom structured so precisely as to allow enough carbon for life to exist in the universe? A theoretical physicist and professor at Columbia University, Brian Greene, he commented on professor of theoretical physics at Stanford University, Leonard Susskind's thinking about the multiverse. The multiverse is a highly controversial schema, and deservedly so. It not only recasts the landscape of reality, but shifts the scientific goalposts. Questions once deemed profoundly puzzling, why do nature's numbers from particle masses to force strengths to the energy suffusing space have the particular values that they do, would be answered with a shrug. Most physicists, string theorists among them, agree that the multiverse is an option of last resort. Looking back, I'm gratified at how far we've come, but disappointed that a connection to experiment continues to elude us. Uh, Mary Jane Rubinstein, writing a new scientist, she said, here's the dilemma. If the universe began with a quantum particle blipping into existence, inflating godlessly into space-time and a whole zoo of materials, then why is it so well-suited for life? For medieval philosophers, the purported perfection of the universe was the key to proving the existence of God. The universe is so fit for intelligent life that it must be the product of a powerful, benevolent external deity. Or, as popular theology might put it today, all this can't be an accident. Modern physics has also wrestled with this fine-tuning problem and supplies its own answer. If only one universe exists, then it is strange to find it so hospitable to life when nearly any other value for the gravitational or cosmological constants would have produced nothing at all. But if there is a multiverse of many universes, all with different constants, the problem vanishes. We're here because we happen to be in one of the universes that works. No miracles, no plan, no creator. Well, again, the multiverse doesn't solve the problem because it's unscientific, being unobservable. It's irrational since it has no evidence. So contradictory to the naturalist, it's, it's also an issue because, again, the multiverse itself is supernatural. It's inadequate since it doesn't even really solve the problem of origins. Notice what Paul Davies said. He's a theoretical physicist, cosmologist, astrobiologist, and professor at Arizona State University. In an article for the New York Times entitled, Taking Science on Faith, he said, The multiverse theory is increasingly popular, but it doesn't so much explain the laws of physics as dodge the whole issue. There has to be a physical mechanism to make all those universes and bestow bylaws on them. This process will require its own laws or meta-laws. Where do they come from? The problem has simply been shifted up a level from the laws of the universe to the meta-laws of the multiverse. In 2011, he said, you still have to explain the multiverse. That still has laws. You need a universe-generating mechanism. So according to Davies, the multiverse theory is just moving the goalpost. It's still not answering the ultimate question, why do we have all of this design? Where do, there has to be a designer, even if it's for the whole multiverse. But more than that, the existence of the multiverse, again, would actually prove the existence of God. Notice what Ellis said. In seeking to explain why nature obeys certain laws and not others, some physicists and philosophers have speculated that nature never made any such choice all conceivable laws apply somewhere. The, the idea is inspired in part by quantum mechanics, which, as Murray Gelman memor memorably put it, holds that everything not forbidden is compulsory. Uh, Joshua Sokol, writing a new scientist, explained that in the multiverse of eternal inflation, 
Everything that can happen has happened and probably happen again and will probably happen again. Lisa Grossman writing in New Scientist. In such an infinite multiverse, everything that has even a slight chance of happening is virtually certain to happen. You just need to wait long enough. Uh, physicist Mark Buchanan said, in the multiverse, every conceivable world exists and individuals identical to you and I live out parallel lives in places we cannot have access to. That's kind of creepy, isn't it? Uh, cosmologist and physicist Paul Steinhardt explained, scanning over all possible bubbles in the multiverse, everything that can physically happen does happen an infinite number of times. Okay, so summarizing those quotes. If in the multiverse, all that can happen happens, and every conceivable world exists, if everything that has even a slight chance of happening is virtually certain to happen, if anything will exist an infinite number of times, if everything that can happen has happened, and probably will happen again, if everything not forbidden is compulsory, then why would it not be the case that, that a God with the characteristics of the one in the Bible would not exist in at least one of those universes? So does the multiverse not demand that God exists? And if not, why not? And if a God like the one, again, in the Bible does exist, that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's every when. So that means that He exists in, if He exists in some universe somewhere, He must exist here as well. And so again, notice the multiverse doesn't solve the problem. It actually just proves the existence of God further. Uh, so God just cannot be dodged. Uh, many biologists intuitively but unconsciously use the term design when they're discussing an, an organism that they're studying. Uh, this feature is designed to do this or that. Others notice that and, and just go ahead and explicitly admit design, but then proceed to redefine the term to avoid the implications of it. Uh, like, for example, Kenneth Miller, evolutionary biologist at Brown University, he said there is indeed a design to life, an evolutionary design. All right, so notice he just admits design, but he proceeds to imply that doesn't mean there's a designer. Okay, so evolution can design according to him. Well, evolutionary design, of course, is what we call an oxymoron. Okay, naturalistic evolution, by definition, is mindless and incapable of designing anything. If there's design, there must be a designer. Uh, so typically, in the, in the first semester or so of engineering school, students are required to take an introductory course that helps them to understand what engineering is and, and the difference, what the differences are between the various engineering fields. Uh, mechanical, electrical, chemical, civil, whatever. So there's usually a, a section on engineering ethics. And along with this intro, there's typically a lengthy discussion on the nature and process of design. Since, after all, that's, that's what engineers do, is design. And in these introductory classes, engineering students learn to appreciate how complex the design process really is. And effective design doesn't just happen. It's not something that you just throw together. And it's certainly not the result of a sequence of random events, like evolutionary theory would suggest. It's not the result of an explosion in a messy room. There's an immense amount of planning and study and thought and intent and purpose that goes into a good design. I would argue this is one of the reasons why in the engineering field you don't see as many atheists. We study design. It's hard to deny it when we see it all around us. So common sense tells us when design is present. It's not complicated to pinpoint something that's complicated. It's not complex trying to put your finger on something that has the attribute of complexity and where there is planning, complexity, and design, there must necessarily be a designer. It's real complicated, isn't it? So as we've seen, even naturalists can't help but admit it. If the universe, according to them, from their own mouth, appears to be just right, uh, has bizarre coincidences, it's unnatural, unusual, special, fine-tuned, even miraculous, baffling, custom-tailored, unexplainable, it's precise, profoundly puzzling, a dilemma, well-suited, and strange. All right, well, to be honest with you, I really couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Okay, this is unheard of. 
I've got 16 more minutes, and I'm done with what I had planned on, on uh, presenting. So I get to go off script again. This is good. You know, there's a question that I intended to hit with my extra time that I had on Thursday, but this is just so rare. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. This is probably providential. I've got extra time. This is good. You know, one big question that, that we may not be hitting on is, we've actually, I've heard it in some sessions, touched on, but this is becoming a, a critical question in this day and age. Whenever I, uh, whenever I was in um, Arkansas, I think it was Russellville, um, a few years ago, and I was presenting my evolution seminar, uh, after one of the sessions, um, some atheistic, well, some professors from the local Arkansas Tech is what it was, some professors, biology professors came up to chew on me, a little bit after the seminar, uh, after that session. One of them was a theistic evolutionist, but the other one was uh, an atheist, and a rabid atheist at that. He's one of these guys that, according to uh, one of the students that was in my, uh, there at the congregation, she had had him as a professor, and he would say at the beginning of the biology course, at the beginning of the semester, you know, raise your hand if you believe in the Bible and you believe in creation. A few people would raise their hand. Well, by the end of this course, you will you'll see you guys are foolish, the evidence disproves the Bible, evolution is true, one of these kind of guys. And so he, he came up and asked the question, okay, let's say you're right, let's say there is a God, you haven't proven which God exists, how do you know which God exists, how do you know that it's not Allah uh, or Buddha, how do you know it's not the Wiccan religion? Uh, he said, you know, how do you know it's not the fl flying spaghetti monster? Raise, I'm curious, raise your hand if, you, if you've heard of the flying spaghetti monster. All right, you will hear about the flying spaghetti monster. Uh, the idea is it's kind of a, it's a way to jab at, at uh, theists. It's a way of saying, look, you know, there's just as much evidence for the flying spaghetti monster as there is your God. And so there's a group called the Pastafarians that uh, believe in the flying spaghetti monster. Right? Anyway, so he throws that out there. Okay, so I, so I said, well, um, you know, so he said, how do you know which God exists? And I said, well, I mean, we, we can know which God exists based on the evidence. And he said, oh yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, I like to hear this. I said, yeah, okay. Um, so we've got a book that has characteristics that humans could not have produced. He sat there. Probably counted at least six seconds. A little drool. He goes, really? I said, yeah, we don't have a blind faith. That's not, that's not a biblical concept. We have positive proof of the God of the Bible. We've got this book that humans could not have written. It has divine characteristics, supernatural characteristics. He sat there again. And then he goes, I'd, I'd like to see that. What are you talking about? Let me tell you, that was a beautiful moment because that does not happen in my line of work, let me tell you. Uh, you, don't, you don't get somebody to a point where they actually want to ask that question. Right? Because the, he, he thought, see, what's, what was alarming to me was that he thought there wasn't an answer to that question. And what, was, and what was further alarming to me is that he's obviously pulled that on people within Christendom and they didn't have an answer to it. You know, there's so many in Christendom that believe that we have a blind faith that whenever he, he pulls that argument out, he wins. It's over. He, he has the rational, the rational position. Right? That's not what the Bible teaches, right? We... we you're supposed to test all things, hold fast what is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. You search for evidence before you believe it, just like the Bereans, Acts 17.11. So anyway, I told him, yeah, we don't, we don't have a blind faith. We've got this book that humans could not have produced. And he, and he said, well, okay, I'd like to see that. But I don't want, and I said, well, we've got this book at AP, uh, Behold the, the Word of God. Behold the Word of God. That's why, that's the purpose of the book. It's to show you the Bible has characteristics which are beyond human ability. He said, well, I don't want to support your organization. I'm not going to uh, pay for this. One of the elders quickly jumped up, bought it for him, and he walked away. I don't know what happened to him. But this is a question we're getting a lot. So I want to restate it again. How do you answer the question, how do you know which God exists? See, notice all of these, we're going through all these classical arguments th this week. You know, your cosmological, teleological, and um, we've hit, what, ontological, Moral was the last session, and I talked about the intuitional and the aesthetic argument. But th these all show there's got to be something beyond nature. Uh, but they aren't telling you which God exists. I mean, that is a valid question. We've got to then go to the next step. And there's two, really two different ways you can approach an answer to that, to that subject. One would be 
to look at the characteristics of the Creator that are implied by the creation. Okay, so if you look at the created order, there are things that it implies about the nature of the Creator. So in the same way you can look at a child, and, uh, and the child can imply things about their parents, can they not? You've seen that in kids? Like if a, if a kid has certain characteristics, maybe uh, certain strengths and weaknesses, it can say something about the parent. It can say something about what the parent emphasizes in their, with regard to their behavior, right? Similarly, you can look at the created order and you can learn certain characteristics about the creator. You can come to know the creator has to be omniscient, omnipotent, uh, omnipresent. There's several, there's all kinds of characteristics that, that the creation indicates about the creator. Okay, so then you look at these characteristics and you, combine, you, you uh, compare that to the gods that humans allege exist, right? And what you find, up, find out is that a lot of times they don't match. The gods that humans come up with do not match what you see when you look at, when you study the created order. So what you, you end up with a very small number of possibilities. The more direct route is, again, to go straight to the Bible. If the Bible is self-authenticating, it is positive proof that humans could not have written it. So we... And I'm, I'm sure, I think we're covering the, the inspiration of the Bible this week. I can't remember if somebody's hitting that. But there's, it, the Bible has all these characteristics. The unity of the Bible. The, uh, the pr- predictive prophecy that you see in the Bible. The, the omissions that the Bible, you know, things that humans would tend to want to put in are absent from the Bible. Uh, several characteristics about the Bible that, that is just, it's, it's unhuman. It's as though there's some being behind humans holding them back restraining them from doing what humans would tend to want to do, right? These are characteristics that are beyond humanity. Once you establish that, you now have positive proof of the supernatural realm. You know which supernatural creator exists. You know, there's not even many materials out there that even claim to be from God. There's just a handful. One of the characteristics of the created order that indicates that the... that, that Okay, let's think about it this way. So the created order... One of the, if you, if you study the, the creatures of the, of the planet, okay, so the creator creates these creatures. One principle that you see everywhere is a parent-child relationship. Have you notice that? It's everywhere. It's not just in hum- humans. And there's a passing of information from parent to child. This is everywhere. This is throughout the entire earth. Okay, that says something about the creator. It says something about what you would expect this, the creator of this earth to do. You would expect communication you, because of this inherent parent-child relationship you see throughout. Okay, so we would expect the creator would communicate with us. Well, again, there's not even many materials out there that claim to be from a creator. And once you start comparing those characteristics to what you see in creation, you start knocking them out, and then you, you study even those materials that claim to be from the Creator, you find out uh, that, that's, that's an evidence of, of human, uh, human origin. Well, now you, you disprove that. Ultimately, all you're left with is the Bible. It's, it's the only book that is able to withstand the scrutiny of showing that humans could not have written this. You know, okay, let me, uh, case in point, let's see if I can remember the details of this. Um, if God wanted to communicate with mankind, you know, what would you expect the Creator uh, to, to do? Would you expect, let's say God wanted to talk to us today, He opens up the roof here, and He just starts talking to us. What language do you expect Him to use? Would He speak to us in our, in our language? Or would He speak to you in, you know, in French or something? Would you expect Him to use an Australian dialect, which is a little bit different than, than American? No, you, it's not something you'd expect. You expect the Creator to communicate with us using our language. Okay, um, so you wouldn't expect the Creator to talk to you in like medieval English. That's something you'd expect. No, you wouldn't expect that. He would talk to us in our language. Okay, now an interesting uh, implication of that is whenever, think, think about the King James Version. The King James Version translated 1611, still a good translation after 400 years. And yet the King James Version has Old English-isms uh, in it that we don't use today, right? Thou, forth, ye, sheweth, right? All this kind of language. We don't talk like that today. So the thou and thee is just this, 
for a first person singular or the second person singular version of you. We don't, we don't talk that way anymore. And, the, and I also didn't talk like that in the 1800s. This had, this had disappeared. The only place you would see that kind of language, I've still got six minutes, this is great. Uh, the only place you would see that, I'm just going on and on here, I'm just, you guys just sit here, I'll go on for four hours. Uh, the only place you would see language like that is really at church, or when you're just reading the King James Version, which was still the dominant version in the 1800s, and yet you don't see people talking like that in the 1800s, uh, you know, so pull out your, the Declaration of Independence. You don't, see that, you don't see that kind of language going on. Okay, so why would, in, say, 1830, if God was communicating with mankind, would he use Old English in 1830 to talk to humans? No, he wouldn't do that. He would use the language of the 1800s. Okay, the Book of Mormon claims to be a translation from God in 1830, and it uses the Old English. Okay, why would it use the Old English? That makes no sense. Why would God do that? Why would he talk to people in 1830 using the Old English? He wouldn't do that. So why does the Book of Mormon contain Old English? That's the question. Okay, well, you and I can, can sort out, sift through why that would be the case. People had apparently come to think of the Old English 1600s language as being something like an inspired dialect. Right? If God talked to you, it's kind of a holy language, he would use thee and thou. Right? And so if you're going to have God talk to you in 1830, you better use King James language or people aren't going to believe it's from God. So that's what Joseph Smith did. The Book of Mormon's loaded with it. But the question is, is that something God would do or humans would do? Well, the, the answer is easy. That's something humans would do if they're wanting to pawn a book off as being from God, but it's really not. Again, once you do this to the materials that claim to be from God, you're only left with the Bible. And it has these characteristics that humans could not have produced. How do you know which God exists? So even the cosmologists have to admit, look, there is evidence of design, and we don't even have, we, we don't even, we got no explanation even for a multiverse. We're not answering the problem. There's just all this evidence. But how do you know which God exists? That's where we got it. That's the next important question. You got to be able to tell people, all right, how you can know which God exists is, the Bible alone has characteristics that humans could not have produced. That puts it in a category of its own. You can know that Jehovah is the true God. All right. I think that's a good place to stop. So thank you for your attention.